응원을 하시고 또 좋아하실까를 많이 생각하고 있습니다. 그래서 어, 실제로 캐릭터를 어, 어, 만드는 과정에서 지금 이 시대에 과연 어떤 캐릭터가 있어 어, 표현이 되어야지 어, 공감대를 더 많이 형성할 수 있을까에 대해서도 굉장히 많이 생각하는데요. 그래서 그래서 그런지 이제 대본에 충실하는 것은 당연하지만은 지금 사회 전반적으로 어떤 흐름으로 흘러가고 있는가를 굉장히 유심히 살펴보고 있습니다. That's why JJ should win and I shouldn't. <웃음> uh, I, I, I do not care. What's this? I, I don't think my acting is uh, helping society. But um, God bless you for thinking that and being a true believer and, a, and an open-hearted person like that. I think I'm a distraction. <웃음> Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Janelle Riley from Variety. And if you're interested in programming like this from the SAG After Foundation, please consider liking this video and subscribing to our YouTube channel. And now it is my pleasure to have our panel of Emmy-nominated lead actors in a drama. Please welcome from Succession, Brian Cox. From Squid Game, Lee Jong-jae. From Better Call Saul, Bob Odenkirk. And from Severance, Adam Scott. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm such a fan of all these shows. It is so exciting. But I would actually love to go back to the beginning. Whenever I have people as accomplished as you are, I like to ask, what was your first job as an actor? The first time, maybe that means the first time you got paid for it or the first time that you felt you could really call yourself an actor, which could be long before you got paid for it. Um, and let's start with Adam. My first, well, I, I get if we were going before I got paid, I guess it would be a, a, a play in, in, in junior high school, but uh, cheaper by the dozen. But I, I remember the first time I got paid as an actor was I was in a background artist in a music video for Tia Carrere in 1993. Uh, and we were in a coffee house and she was singing and I was in the background and didn't quite get that you're, that, that you're not supposed to talk and improvise and try. I was trying to come up with a whole backstory with the woman who I was sitting at a table with. It was supposed to be a coffee house and I was trying to get uh, really into it and trying to come up with subjects for us to talk about. And if we're having relationship trouble, I was trying to come up with a whole thing and she was, she was not having any of it. Um, so it was simultaneously my first uh, paid gig in Hollywood and a good introduction uh, to, to Hollywood because she was she was just having none of me. <laughs> Can we find this online? I want to go back and, and I don't know. That's a good <laughs> question. I'm not sure. I'm going to take a look because I'm fascinated by by extras a lot of times in mm. seats, especially when they're stealing focus. <laughs> Bob, what about for you? Yeah, it's weird. I mean, I want to say better call Saul. Um, <laughs> I did an awful lot of performing and on screen and, and even on stage, but um, I never really thought about, boy, even Breaking Bad as, was challenging at times, but not like Better Call Saul made me deal with what, I don't know, what acting might be. I, I didn't go to school for it. I didn't study it. I just wrote a lot of my own stuff and uh, performed in it. And so it's weird. That was the first time I thought about acting. And what I'm, what is, what is this thing I'm trying to do and how would you do it? And uh, I could only work backwards from having been a writer. And luckily I was surrounded by pros like um, Ray Seahorn and Michael McKeon, especially who I was able to watch at work. So. That's amazing. Brian, for you. Uh, my first job was when I was 15. I started at Dundee Repertory Theatre. This was in 1961. And um, I, my first job was playing Joseph in a play called The Dover Road by A.A. A. Milne. And I had to play a guy who was an ex-boxer who was probably in his late 40s, but I was 15. And I had to serve a meal. Uh, part of it, we were servants in this house. And I had to serve this meal, um, which I'd never done before. And we served this white fish with a white sauce. And... I was up at the back. I was at the back of the stage and putting the white the fish on the plate. 
and I dropped the fish on the floor. And then I sort of pretended that nobody could see me, so I picked the fish up. But And then I had to hand it out to all the other actors. I had to serve it. But I had white on my arm, but I didn't see it. So I ended up covering all the actors in white sauce. Um, and that was my stage debut. I love that. It's only uphill from there, right? Yeah, it was uphill from then on. <laughs> JJ, it was, for you. it was a sign of the times for me. <laughs> JJ, for you? Uh,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,中国人,
because I was going to do How I Met Your Mother already scheduled. And because I was not available for that fourth episode, they had to invent the character of Mike Ehrmantraut, played by Jonathan Banks. And, uh, you know, that's uh, another lucky, fortuitous moment because he obviously started Better Call Saul with me. That character also became uh, an important character to the universe of Breaking Bad. That's amazing. I didn't know that. Yeah. And only after they invented Mike did they realize that Saul Goodman would never have done the work that they needed Mike to do. He would have hired somebody like Mike. But uh, initially they were going to have me help remove the body. And uh, of course, of course, Saul would not help you do that. Wow. That's incredible. Unless there was money inside the body. <laughs> you know, I have to say as a Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul fanatic, I already know these behind the scenes, this behind the scenes trivia. I know all of all of these uh because I, I try and read everything and I'm wow. just sort of fanatically uh, Thanks, waiting Mike. for those last two episodes too. Can't wait. Thanks you know so how much. it ends? Can you share with us, Adam? Me? No. Yeah. Oh, God, no. I'm <laughs> waiting <laughs> diligently by my uh, iPad waiting for the uh, episodes to appear. Yeah. One of the great things is I know what happens in the last two episodes and they feel when I think about the story, it feels like I'm talking about five episodes, like the, mm -hmm. the journeys that the plot goes on and the characters go on in just two episodes feel impossible almost to fit into two. Yeah. So. Incredible. Um, Brian, for you, Succession uh, is coming off of its third season and uh, somehow it just keeps getting better and better. But I'm curious what initially attracted you to the role of Logan Roy and the project overall, because he's he's kind of changed uh, a bit over the last couple of seasons. Yeah, it's just a great role. You know, I mean, I I got a call from uh, Jesse Armstrong and Adam McKay. Jesse was in Italy and Adam McKay was in, I think he was in Los Angeles and I was in London. And they called me and they said, we're doing this show. And initially, my manager had told me that the, the part was only going to be in one season. They said he'll probably die at the end of the first season. And I said, <laughs> oh, OK, fine. Yeah, I'm OK. I'm, <laughs> I was up for it. I said, fine, let's work. I don't care. <laughs> so uh, they, uh, they called me. And uh, I could tell, by the way, they pitched that this was something extraordinary. And I'd seen Jesse's work in the UK. He, he did an amazing series called In the Thick of It, which was pretty incredible about really about the Blair government. It was a sort of, and it's this kind of documentary style that he used. And uh, and I just thought, well, this is a really great writer. And Adam McKay's work, of course, I knew as well. And I thought, well, this is an amazing combination. So it was a no-brainer, you know, it was a no-brainer. And then I said that the, you know, as we got into the conversation, I, I said, that, so it's only one season. And there was a big long pause on either side of the Pacific and the Atlantic. And then both of them said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I think we're going to have it longer than one season. And so that was what happened. Wow. So it was a very, no, it's just, uh, it's just one of those roles. You know, it's an iconic role. Uh, it's a hard role because, uh, well, no, it's not a hard role. I mean, it's a great role to play, but it's hard because of the ramifications of it. You know, I've, I prided myself. You know, having been in the business for nearly 60 years, I prided myself on my anonymity, and now that's gone. And I sort of, I kind of, kind of slightly resent that, I have to say, but that's, that's life. But it's great. I, I can't knock it. You know? And JJ Squid Game for us became an overnight phenomenon, but I would love to know how you came to be cast and if you had any idea if this was something special. You probably didn't know it'd be a worldwide phenomenon, but could you tell just in hearing the story and hearing the script that you that there was something special there? Yeah. Uh, Hundugeson 많은 서바이벌 게임의 컨텐츠하고 무엇이 다를까라는 궁금증이 있었는데 
이 안에는 굉장히 어, 많은 다양한 사람들의 어떤 그러한 어, 아픔을 딛고 어, 우리가 꼭이 사회에서 경쟁을 하면서 꼭 이겨야만 하는가 사람을 다치게 하면서 마음을 다치게 하면서까지도 이겨야만 하는가 라는 메시지가 담겨 있어서 아, 꼭 해야 되겠다라고 생각했고 이렇게 크게 성공할 줄은 몰랐습니다. And what you just said about thinking you would read one or two but staying up and reading them all that was basically me but watching it. I was like one more episode next thing I knew it was 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, I'm surprised you got all the scripts because Adam, I was curious about this. What did they tell you going into Severance? Because the show is so secretive. I'm, I'm imagining they didn't tell you the whole arc or maybe they did. Maybe I, maybe they trust you that much, but what made you want to take on the role? Um, they, they, we shot the whole season at once, kind of like a big movie. So we had all nine scripts, uh, the, the whole, the whole, everybody did. So, um, which was uh which was kind of great to know exactly you know where everything was going <clears throat> um i first heard about the show like a few years ago it was like january 2017 i think ben stiller called me and just told me about this role and he kind of was thinking of me for it but they didn't really have scripts yet but he just kind of gave me the big idea of the show and the sort of a quick elevator pitch of it and just said, you know, I just want to put a bug in your ear about it. If it ever ends up happening, I was just thinking of you. And, uh, and it was a couple of years until I ever really read anything. And that whole time I couldn't, you know, stop thinking about it. And I was always hoping something would come of it because, you know, you never know and stuff usually doesn't come together. And then when I finally did get a couple of scripts, I sort of, you know, it felt like too good to be true. And I've sort of learned over the years to not think anything, anything is really going to happen. And this role is so terrific. I just figured it wouldn't, I would not play this role. <laughs> I just honestly thought this is not going to end up coming together. At least for me, I don't think uh, that's going to happen. But if I do, if I get to actually get this job and play this role it'll be as if like i've been earning this the past 20 some odd years the 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 chance to to play a role like this in a show like this uh just because it was sort of everything that i'd ever wanted to do sort of and, and the kind of show that i really gravitate towards as an audience member. You know, I grew up watching Twilight Zone and and uh, and love um, things in this in this genre and also just love Ben and love uh, um, his filmmaking and trust him so much as a as a person and as a as a collaborator. So I was, uh, you know, obviously really um, thrilled and, and lucky to to get to uh, be a part of the show. I mean, you say they kind of gave you the elevator pitch, but what is the elevator pitch for this? I mean, those are usually yeah. 20 seconds long and I can't even imagine. It's Did a long say, elevator well, ride. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, it was basically just the idea of, you know, this this world where you can bifurcate your, your memories and this guy is, it's kind of the story of this guy kind of dipping into both worlds and he's escaping this tragedy in his life by, by, um, by getting severed and going into this, this other world. And with the company, it's sort of this big corporation and they're mysterious. It was just a really quick sort of generalized version of, of that, that big idea. That was 27 seconds. That was pretty good. 27 seconds. Yeah. Right. Which was exactly what Ben did. It's 27 seconds on the phone in 2017. So I mean, these are all, they're, they're such great shows, but they're also very huge in the zeitgeist with these, these kind of fanatical fan bases. I'm curious what it's sort of like to interact with the fans. Do they come up and ask you for answers? Brian, I know that like, do people still keep asking you to tell them to fuck off? Yes, people I by, human beings are very much into self-abuse <laughs> and uh, I fulfill that need. 
on a regular basis so I can tell them to fuck off regularly. And it's the easiest thing to say to people, oh, fuck off. You know, it's so nice, so nice just to say fuck off. So it first happened when I was doing, I was playing LBJ at the Beaumont Theatre of Lincoln Centre. And uh, there was this couple of kids. I mean, she must have been 17. He was 17 and they were out for a night and they came and they had the video and they said, could you tell us to fuck off? Oh, fuck off. And that was, <laughs> that was it. That was the start. And the worst, the, the, the funniest thing, the funniest thing I ever had of that, the audition was going to a Me Too thing with uh, Ronan Farrow. And there were all these intense Hollywood women. This was organized by Rosanna Arquette. And she said, why don't you come along? And I went along and I, was, I arrived late and I was listening to these, him read the bits of his book. And it was all fascinating, very intense, you know, Me Too and what's going on. And, and suddenly they all turned around. They saw me at the back of the room and they came up with their videos and said, can you tell us to fuck off? And I'm going, <laughs> is that really appropriate at a Me Too meeting that you get an old white, dodo males telling you to fuck off well happily just fuck off <laughs> <laughs> and you can make them so happy by saying that oh I yeah that. i mean people are really happy to be told to fuck off i, I never realized that until now <laughs> <laughs> you you did say though that you have lost a little little bit of your anonymity um how have you been dealing with that it's, it's not easy i mean i i don't know i've always prided that or people going, are you, oh no, uh, or maybe, were you, no, no, you know, I, I mean, that was great for many, many years. It's all right, you know, but it's it's just sometimes, you know, you're, and one tries to be graceful and polite, but sometimes you want to go, no, don't want to do a photo, no, sorry, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, but you have to be, it's, it's a balancing act, you know, and you just have to be, people, people on the whole are usually very polite, you get the odd asshole but basically people are quite polite and bob i've been to albuquerque where i know like I, i've been to los polos hermanos i know how much the city loves you all and i know how fanatical people can get about this show especially now that we're down to the last couple episodes <laughs> um, what has it been like with people like i did earlier trying to bug you to find out what's happening and, and some of these conspiracy theories they have are so yeah. good yeah, well, honestly, we did a thing the other day where people wrote their theories and Ray and I talked about them and uh, some of them got pretty close to, uh, but I, you know, I can't say which ones. And uh, I think that more, um, it's, it's not really so much that they were able to detail the incidents of what happens, but rather the sort of uh, inner journey that we go, we end at which is uh, in a very, very general way, uh, similar to Breaking Bad, but not remotely that way in the specifics. Uh, but uh, the characters, uh, the way I'll put it is the characters are granted a little bit of the kind of self-awareness that you sort of always assume they had. And uh, that's really nice because it's, it's hard to play somebody who's so... Um, so good with people and who's so aware of what everyone's thinking and using their feelings against them, but he can't see himself at all, uh, or at least not completely. And, and it's been hard at times to say, why can he not understand what he's doing? Cause he's just so good at this. And same goes for uh, Ray as Kim Wexler. She had a similar issue. Um, but in the end, I think the character's, uh, and this tells you nothing about the circumstance, but they're they're granted that. And yeah, so it's fun. It's fun that we're in a show. But I'll say it again. The last two episodes, I know what happens and you could never tell me that journey. It's just the, the, dis the distance as it goes internally and then switches is and, I, and the fact that they make it all flow and have emotional logic to it is incredible. How surreal was it to go back to the start for you and shoot all those years later? Yeah. A scene that you had done in 2013. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm always worried about how I look because I'm, I'm uh, 13 years older and uh, I just don't look the same. The makeup people are incredible. And they did some great work. They do amazing work with just makeup. I mean, they fill out my cheeks. It's just amazing. Um, but I also think the audience has 
been very kind to us. And I think that goes back to Breaking Bad as well. Um, they, they are really, I don't think we should, I'm glad it's ending because I would feel not good about carrying on trying to be this guy uh, as far as my age and my look. Um, and, and the audience has, I think, been a partner in us being able to do this because there are just our times when you can see I'm, I'm older. And, uh, and, and so it's, uh, you know, I don't have trouble playing the energy of him, especially because of the person he was during Breaking Bad. He was very surface and very loud. And uh, it's kind of an easy energy to mimic. Um, playing the uh, choices of a younger person and making them feel really honest is very challenging because I think that there are times I don't really know the ages of the character, but I'm going to take a guess that there are scenes in the series where I'm meant to be 27 and I'm 59. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, we did some CGI work, actually. You did. Oh, I was curious if you did. Yeah. <laughs> really though i think i don't think it's as noticeable as you think it is i've never had a problem and especially when you juxtapose it with gene who is supposed to be yes president. gene's easy to play because he's closer to my age and uh uh i uh i think we just got very lucky we rode the edge here we're <laughs> very lucky to be wrapping up right here right now <laughs> Adam, similarly for you, you're, there's so much secrecy around surrounding your show, but you might have the advantage of not actually knowing what some of the answers are. I don't know if you know what the goats mean or how this all plays out. How do you sort of deal with it when, when people in your life want to know? Or maybe people in your life aren't that nosy. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I remember like a couple months uh, after the show started airing, we were sort of marveling at the fact that now all of a sudden people care about all the, cause we made the show like in this bubble, you know, and we're working on it for a couple of years and the whole time just thinking like, this is so weird. We have no idea if anyone will want to watch this. Uh, and, and then it comes out and it catches on a bit and suddenly people are asking questions, like you said, about the goats and all of these things that we just thought were so strange and, uh, and suddenly you have to be really secretive about scripts and storylines and all of this stuff. It's, uh, it's strange when you're making something that in a bubble that starts to feel like just a, a project with your friends. And then suddenly uh, a lot of eyes are interested in it. It's a really terrific um, circumstance to be in, but it, it, it took some, uh, some adjusting, certainly. Are you generally good at keeping secrets? Yeah, yeah. I am because I, I, I know as an audience member, I like, I don't want to know what happens in better call. Saul. I want to watch those last couple episodes and experience it. So, um, so yeah, I think it's, it's really fun to have something that people are curious about and that has these big questions that people are craving the answers for and that they have to wait and, and you know, all that stuff's really great. And JJ, for you, was there, was there a moment you sort of realized Squid Game had become this worldwide phenomenon? I, and I don't know if you've seen, like I've done this myself. I've played the Squid Games. They've set up interactions at like Netflix and such where people, I always die on the honeycomb round. So <laughs> it doesn't matter. But I've seen people get really far with like the glass bridge. And um, is that fun for you to watch? Or, you know, it was a very traumatic experience to do as an actor. So I, I wonder if, if, if you find that amusing or if you kind of find it, find it kind of horrifying. Uh,
그런데 저희가 그 오징어 게임을 이제 방송하고 나서 실제로 어린 친구들도 저희가 했었던 그 옛날 그 게임을 실제로 친구들끼리 많이 하고 있다라는 얘기를 들어서 되게 반갑고 즐거웠고요. 그리고 촬영할 때도 역시 그 징검다리 글라스 다리를 이제 통과하는 그 어, 장면은 어, 실제로 저희가 진짜로 그 글라스 위를 뛰어다녔었기 때문에 어, 너무 좀, 어, 좀 무섭기도 했고, 그 다음에 실제로 제가 발바닥에 땀이 너무 많이 나가지고, 글래스에서 자꾸 미끄러져가지고, 엔지도 나고, 뭐, 넘어졌었던 그런 기억이 있습니다. You say these games are easy, but I can't get past the first round. So, <laughs> they're not that easy, I have to say. Being the lead on a series comes with a certain responsibility as well. I, I, I often hear about how the lead of a series sets the tone for a set. And I'm curious for, for all of you, if there are things that you learned from other actors that you know you wanted to do, or maybe maybe things you learned that you didn't want to do as the lead on a series, what, what sort of atmosphere do you like to encourage when filming? Well, Brian Cranston was a great you know, lead actor uh, on screen and off. And uh, he, did the, he did the prank thing. I don't do the prank thing playing pranks on people because I don't, I just don't, I don't have time. <laughs> but um, he was very fun. He kept things fun and light, but serious when the work started. And uh, I think for us, we were great friends, this cast. And we, we spent a lot of time rehearsing. And so we were able to show up pretty prepared. Um, and, you know, a degree of consideration for each other and, um, another thing that carried over from Breaking Bad is nobody gets, uh, I had a two banger trailer, two, two people use it, and nobody gets more than that. And that was from Brian Cranston. Brian said to me, put that in your contract. You got a two banger and nobody gets more than that. And uh, I have, and I have it on my next series as well. It's, it keeps anybody from getting like, ah, oh, I want to need my own trailer now. And he's got a better one than me. And uh, when do I get my own? And the other thing is it makes it easier to move around the locations. Uh, plus, you don't need anything because you're working. There's nothing to do in your trailer except waste 15 minutes. And uh, so anyway, that was, it. you know, it was focused on work and about helping make this thing happen, helping the crew helping this thing to go. So you share a trailer on the set? Yeah, uh, two, two you know, people in, it's, a, it's called a two banger and it's got two front doors and two separate cabins. But the point is nobody gets better than that. And, and then it makes it easier. There's fewer trucks to move from location to location and nobody's having a trailer fight. I love that. Brian, what about for you? I think the important thing on any show is the team. And it's not just the actors, it's the whole crew, it's everybody. And everybody's on the same page. Uh, and, uh, you know, team playing is really, really important on a show like ours, you know, so that we're all very much in each other's pockets and we have to acknowledge one another's foibles and, and get on with it, you know. But at the same time, we have to create a unity. And it's also particularly true of how you 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 treat the the members of the the crew, you know. And I, I think one has to, uh, as the leading actor, you have to find out when there are problems. And sometimes there are problems, you know, like somebody's been rude to craft services or something like that. Something which is seems odd, but in a way, it, it's it's the creating of the atmosphere that's important and creating of the work the working space, how you work and how, and the conduciveness for work. And I think that's the most important aspect of it, really, of, of, of the team. And just, re and, and reminding that, uh, you know, nobody's, I mean, I, I, you know, it, I think our business is really quite egalitarian. And it's probably more egalitarian than any other business because it's really is about sharing and about the notion of it, you know. I mean, there are different responsibilities, of course. The, the actors have different responsibilities. But when I watch, for instance, some of our camera guys who do the most extraordinary things, you know, and they are the sort of unsung heroes, what they do. And uh, I have nothing but deep admiration for them. But it's also important that they're acknowledged, 
you know, uh, on a regular basis, you know, that we keep that acknowledgement going of not just us, but the, the whole thing. And I, I think that's what makes for a, for a happy unit, really. JJ, for you? Uh, 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 그리고 또내 생각을 상대방에게 알려줌으로써 팀 플레이어가 굉장히 더잘 이루어지도록 그런 어, 현장에서 어, 그런 이, 어, 그런 그사그그 그, 그, 서로 간의 어떤 그런 대화를 끊임없이 많이 했던 것 같아요. 그리고 촬영 끝나고도 항상 같이 식사를 하면서. 오늘 촬영의 기분이 어땠는지 어떤 것들이 좋았는지 이런 것에 대해서 계속 얘기하고 다음 날 촬영할 때는 좀더 우리가 이런 모습을 좀더 만들어 보면 어떻겠는가 이런 대화를 굉장히 많이 했습니다. All these shows have such amazing ensembles. It is, it is, it's no coincidence. I think that all of your co-stars are nominated as well. Um, Adam, what about for you? Um, I think you know Amy Poehler being uh, on. Parks and Rec for a few years and watching her was a really, really terrific example uh, for the number one and how they should, how, you know, in an ideal world, how the lead uh, actor would, would behave. And uh, I really, you know, learned a lot watching her and tried, tried to carry as much, uh, over to uh, other jobs as possible. And I think uh, that I learned from her. And I think, you know, a lot of that is just being incredibly gracious and inclusive. A lot of what these guys have been saying, um, you know, on set, there's no dumb ideas. Everyone should feel comfortable um, either advocating for themselves or sharing an idea and seeing, you know, seeing what, you know, something I, I first learned on a Adam McKay set Brian was talking about Adam earlier is just the unpreciousness of how Adam works was sort of a sort of a, a just this revolutionary moment for me just seeing them the, the, the way these guys worked was let's just throw it all against the wall let's just see what happens and if it doesn't work great we won't use it like who cares we just won't use it but then let's see what we get out of that that's of value. And uh, I think in that also, it was really empowering to everyone uh, on the set. I remember one of the best lines uh, that ended up in Step Brothers was suggested by uh, one, of the, one of the people on the camera crew. Um, so, so I think that that's, uh, that's something, you know, on Parks and Rec, everybody was happy. Everyone felt completely comfortable uh, to share whatever whatever idea they may have, and everyone felt really included and valued, and uh, and I think that's that's really important. By the way, you know, I told Adam not too long ago that they should have take your uh, "I got to get home and oil my jacket" line in Step Brothers. He should have gone with that yeah. one. He actually agreed. <laughs> he says he that's wishes right. he had that take. Yeah. That's right. Instead of the whatever Dane they, Cook. I, I don't know. Oh, Here's Dane your Cook, line right, was right. Dane Cook pay per view twenty minutes. I That's believe right. That's might right. be a little obsessed with Step Brothers. I apologize. <laughs> uh, this sort of ties into that last question, but because we do have so many actors watching us, is there one piece of advice you'd want to give our base of working actors or something you wish you had known coming into this business? I'm sorry, Brian has a cat and it's adorable how it's stalking behind you right now. Um, oh. It just called my attention. Oh, my <laughs> I, I just saw something moving. I didn't even realize what it was. Um, but I'm sure people must ask you for advice all the time on breaking into the industry, surviving in this industry, anything that, that springs to mind. And this time I'm going to make a start with Adam because I keep making him wait till the end for some reason. Um, I think my advice now is always just make your own stuff. You know, it's, it's sort of easier than ever because we all have a pretty great camera uh, in our 
pocket at all times and or most of us do and 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 you just you can make stuff and 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 just keep making it and if it's good then great people will check it out and if it's not good so what just keep making more and you'll just get better and better you can you know shoot and edit a a movie or a little video or whatever you want just on your phone and just put it up on youtube or wherever you want and uh and if it's good people will see it um and if they don't who cares just keep keep making stuff jj for you uh 글쎄요 뭐 사실 어 관객분들이 요즘 어떤 이야기를 더 재밌어 하시고 흥미로워 하실까 그리고 또그 안에서 어떤 성격의 캐릭터를 더 어, 응원을 하시고 또 좋아하실까를 많이 생각하고 있습니다. 그래서 어, 실제로 캐릭터를 어, 어, 만드는 과정에서 지금 이 시대에 과연 어떤 캐릭터가 있어 어, 표현이 되어야지 어, 공감대를 더 많이 형성할 수 있을까에 대해서도 굉장히 많이 생각하는데요. 그래서 그래서 그런지 이제 대본에 충실하는 것은 당연하지만은 지금 사회 전반적으로 어떤 흐름으로 흘러가고 있는가를 굉장히 유심히 살펴보고 있습니다. Love that. And uh, can I go? Of course. That's why JJ should win and I shouldn't. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do not care. What's this? I, I don't think my acting is uh, helping society. But um, God bless you for thinking that. And I, I hope that it does. God bless you for being a true believer and, a, and an open hearted person like that. I think I'm a distraction <laughs> and uh, uh, hopefully a fun and involving one. Um, and I would say to young actors, make sure that your life is more important than acting. And, uh, and then if acting is second, that's good. And you should still love it. You should be doing it because you love it. Absolutely. And Brian? I take Bob's point in a way. I, I think it's, it's this balance between what is serious and what is light. And one shouldn't outweigh the other. You know, it's a kind of mixture of both. You've got to keep it light. You've got to keep it, you've got to keep moving. I mean, it's not about a religious experience, really. It really isn't about a religious experience. That's for the audience. They can have the religious experience. Uh, actors who have religious experiences, I go, you know, come on, come off it. You know, we're just, we're there. We're just doing our job. And it's the doing of the job. You know, the great actors are the ones who did the jobs. If you see Tracy, if you see any of those great actors that I, I adore, they just did the fucking job. They came on, they learned their lines, and they didn't bump into the furniture. And I think there's a very strong element of that, which I really believe in. There's so much kind of boring mystique about what we do, and it's not. You know, it's the imagination. It's pretending. And I always wish actors, some actors would just remember it's pretending. You know, and also, why do you do it? What's the purpose? And some people, you know, I went to, a, I did a class at the Stella Adler Studio the other day, and I asked the kids, why do they do it? But they, they could all tell me about their own experience and what they were getting out of it. I can say, you're not actually answering the question. Why do you fucking do it? Why do you do the job? Now, you don't have to, you just have to know that answer. It doesn't mean you've got to expostulate for everybody in the room why, but at least you know why you're doing it. So there is a sense of purpose to what you do. And it's your own purpose. But I think there's a lot of cant and nonsense talked about our job, you know, and it's, uh, it's a lot more simpler. I, I go with Bob in a way. I, I, I think he's, he's got the right idea. And I think it's, I, I think it's healthy. You know, it's, 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 you know it's, there's no great science to it. It's the best job in the world. I love it. I wouldn't want to do anything else. I've done it for 60 years, so I absolutely adore the job. But at the same time, you know, don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm going to plug your book because if you read Brian's book, Putting the Rabbit in the Hats, it's full of, I don't know if it's intentional advice, but it's full of great advice for actors, I feel. So um, I'll, I'll tell people to, to check that out. Um, I want to thank you all so much for making the time to be here today. On behalf can, of I, can I say one more thing? Please. Janelle, in past years, I've, I've said to in these, if I've ever done these events, I've always said, 
you know, I'm surrounded by excellence and, you know, everyone deserves it more than me, but this is the first year I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> we won't Bob, tell everyone Bob, else. Bob, don't, don't dish yourself. You do a pretty fucking I know. good job. Come you really on, do. it's a master class. Yeah, you my really God. Do. And you've, you've, gr- I mean, to watch you over the years create what you've created, it's pretty remarkable. Oh, thank really. you so much. Thank you. And I, you can cut this out later if Bob, this embarrasses Bob, but the last time I saw you, actually, you came in with the Breaking Bad group to do a Q&A at the SAG After Foundation. Cool. And, uh, and you, you and Brian went and stood in the back and watched the end of the episode. It's the one where Walter shoots someone for the first time, like my space work, Walter shoots someone. And you both came out giggling and like, it was the cutest thing ever. And I remember you had the same sort of attitude at the time that you were overwhelmed to be there with like great actors. And they all were like, you belong here with us. So I'm just going to re- uh, reiterate that. You belong right. here with us. <laughs> Someday I'll believe you. Take care. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you <laughs> Brian. That means an awful right. lot coming from you. And thank oh, you absolutely. all of you totally. guys. I think we all agree. Absolutely. It really is a great, it really is a great uh, group of people here. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much. Agree wholeheartedly. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.